Some radiology reports can be challenging to read or even a little frustrating to decipher. In this talk, we're going to explain the how and why. If you write radiology reports, we'll help you become better acquainted with some practices that can make your reports a little easier for others to understand. And if you read radiology reports, we'll help you develop a better understanding of the things going on behind the scenes that influence how radiology reports get written the way that they do. Radiology reports are the official documentation of the interpretation and verdict for an ultrasound, CT, X-ray, MRI, or other imaging study. Most radiology reports are created by a board-certified radiologist. While a very, very small number of radiology reports may be form-based, like this NIOSH chest X report used when screening and monitoring workers exposed to mineral dusts, radiology reports are, as a rule, text-only compositions. Recent years have seen some efforts to make radiology reports a little easier to read, mostly through standardizing their structure. For example, radiology reports these days typically contain three major sections. A header section that can contain any of the following. Patient history, reason for the imaging study, um, the intended question the imaging study is supposed to answer, a technical description of how the imaging study was performed, what comparison studies were consulted during the interpretation. There's a findings section that provides an objective account of pertinent imaging findings present on the imaging study, and sometimes pertinent imaging findings that were absent as well. Depending on radiologists' personal preferences, this could be conveyed as a string of short sentence fragments or in prose. The findings sections of more advanced imaging studies are often subdivided according to organ system. And finally, there is an impression or conclusion section where the interpretation and explanation of the findings happens, where the diagnosis or a differential diagnosis is provided, and sometimes recommendations made for what next steps and follow-up measures should occur. The impression section is the part of the report referring providers primarily focus on. While rudimentary efforts to enforce some high-level report structure can make radiology reports a little easier to read, they're not necessarily heeded by 100% of all radiologists, and more importantly, opportunities still abound for bespoke written expression and vocabulary to appear, factors that continue to make some radiologist reports easier to read and others not so easy. An important reason why radiology reports can sometimes be tough to decipher is because this single document has to serve many different masters and uses at the same time. There are many different kinds of people in the healthcare system who use radiology reports, each with slightly different use cases, expectations, and knowledge bases. For the interpreting radiologist who's writing the radiology report, the initial draft of the report is a critical workspace where a continuous flow of observations and some preliminary interpretations are dictated and captured in real time as the systematic inspection of an imaging study progresses. The initial draft of a radiology report can be a little over comprehensive at times since it may not be clear which observations will be relevant and which won't be as the interpretation of an imaging study first unfolds. In addition, Jargon can pop up a bit, since jargon can sometimes have the upside of being contextually and information dense. As the initial draft is usually the framework upon which the final report is based, attributes of this initial draft, unsurprisingly, can persist in the final radiology report. Primary care providers are another very important stakeholder in the radiology report. What these busy folks at the front lines of healthcare seek from the radiology report is not a workspace for imaging interpretation, but a lucid and preferably concise explanation for what's going on for the patient and the radiologist's degree of certainty. For generalists, clear and specific insights into appropriate next steps for managing their patient are often useful. Subspecialists 
seek similar things from a radiology report as a primary care provider does. However, they may also expect more nuance and detailed discourse that may help guide more complex clinical decision making. As subspecialists tend to be much more intimately versed in the workup and treatments within their scope of practice than primary care providers, the need for specific recommendations, at least within their scope of practice, tends to be a little different when compared to primary care providers. The radiologist who comes along in a few days, weeks, or months' time to read the patient's follow-up imaging study is another stakeholder of the radiology report. In this case, the radiology report is a vehicle that may provide insights into um, guiding what the follow-up imaging study should be, how it should be performed, and what aspects of the patient may require particular attention. Patients read radiology reports as well. What patients, particularly those without a background in healthcare, may seek from a radiology report is a simple description of what's going on in plain language, an explanation of how important any anomalies mentioned are, all conveyed with as little ambiguity as possible. Billers and coders also read radiology reports in order to make sure that their hospital or practice gets properly reimbursed for the imaging study that was performed. If key words, phrases, and technical terms can be easily spotted in the radiology report, billers and coders can uh, bill or code an imaging study more efficiently and accurately. Medical researchers are another user of radiology reports. Researchers um, tend to prefer reports that make it as easy as possible to extract the data they want, sometimes retrospectively. Characteristics like a highly standardized report structure, formatting, content, and vocabulary are valued. Finally, folks in the legal field sometimes read radiology reports as well, with an eye towards malpractice risk exposure. To them, the radiology report is a written record of whether the standard of care occurred. Let's say an acutely actionable diagnosis was made by a radiologist and the referring provider notified promptly, well, is there written evidence to corroborate this? As you can see, a radiology report serves many different types of people at the same time, each with slightly different needs and preferences, and the ones we covered were just some of them. Concurrently fulfilling every stakeholder's expectations is not only challenging, but efforts can sometimes be hindered by real-world factors too. For example, editing and crafting radiology reports well takes time. However, medical imaging volumes continue to grow and outpace radiologist staffing in many practices, which means that radiologists face persistent pressure to spend less time rather than more time editing reports. Imaging studies are not perfect arbiters and can't always deliver clean, 100% accurate black and white results. Uncertainty is inherent in many imaging studies and influences how definitive reports themselves can be. Radiologists receive relatively minimal formal structured training in report writing during their residency and fellowship. Whatever training that does happen occurs within an apprenticeship model with transitory exposure to many different teachers, each with, the, each with their own attitudes, styles, and abilities. The learning process for report writing is passive and idiosyncratic. Opportunities to perfect writing abilities have come under additional pressure in recent years due to increasing case volumes in the reading room and particularly during the COVID era and social distancing. Opportunities to solicit and receive feedback that could prod a radiologist to improve the way they write reports tends to be limited too. Referring providers may often be hesitant to directly criticize their radiologist colleagues' writing styles, or for that matter, questioning the content of a report for fear of being judged too. So let's start going over some commonly encountered features in radiology reports that can impede people's ability to decipher them. We'll begin with number one, the overuse of stilted language, particularly in the finding sections of radiology reports. Overly formal, unnatural, and complex phrasing tends to inject a lot of extraneous verbiage that can shroud the actual message of a report 
and demand an extra expenditure of time and effort by the reader to sift through. Redundant language substantially contributes to the stilted language in many radiology reports. For example, the passage on top here could probably have been much more concisely expressed as the passage here on the bottom. Redundant language often appears in radiology reports because a radiologist's dictation will often closely follow their real-time mental workflow as they're inspecting an imaging study step-by-step. Step. A radiologist sees a finding and dictates that. They compare that finding to the way it appeared on a prior study and dictates that, and so on. In an ideal work environment, a radiologist would mentally cache everything they saw and then dictate a succinct statement at the end. However, in the real world, radiologists get interrupted frequently in the middle of their workflow by things like a phone call or a consultation, and it's sometimes easy to forget where you left off if you were just mentally caching and not writing everything down in real time as they presented. Another contributor to redundant language is hedging. Take, for example, a passage such as the one on top here, which contains three hedges in a row, probably, most likely, and in keeping with. A more succinct statement such as, multiple lung nodules, probably metastases, would express the same thing with no effect on the degree of certainty conveyed and be much easier to read. Radiologists' penchant for hedging, it seems, may sometimes be influenced by how often they may have previously found themselves in an unpleasant situation where there may have been, um, they may have been burned by an over-optimistic expectation about the inherent accuracy, precision, sensitivity, or specificity of an imaging study that was reported. Perceptual phrases that add no value littered throughout the finding section of radiology reports also contribute to stilted language. For example, a passage such as the one on top here would retain all of its meaning if the phrases there are and visualized were absent. Tautologies. Verbalizing the same concept twice in different ways are another contributor to stilted language in the findings sections of radiology reports. Tautologies um, in radiology reports tend to most often involve discussions about size and comparison. For example, in the passage atop here, nine millimeters is inherently a size. And in the passage on top here, the fact that the right pleural effusion has increased inherently means that there has been two points of observation with an interval of time in between. Number two, disorganization not only makes the finding sections of radiology reports more difficult to comb through, but disorganization can increase the odds a reader might miss something as well. Let's say you're making a shopping list for a trip to the supermarket. Would you prefer a shopping list where the items were listed arbitrarily or a list where all the produce items were grouped together, then all the dairy items, then all the canned goods? Even though modern radiology report templates enforce some degree of organization, there are plenty of opportunities for disorganized reporting to happen. For example, a passage describing multiple items of the same type, in this case lung nodules, um, in the passage on top here, may be much more easily digested when organized in the form in the, as the passage on the bottom. Another example, in this case, a passage is describing multiple aspects of one organ system, in this case, the lymph nodes. The key issue, bulky lymphadenopathy, gets discussed discontinuously. A reader quickly scanning through this passage could easily miss the bulky lymphadenopathy in the right paratrachal region that's described after a description of these benign calcified and subcenter lymph nodes that follow the description of the initial bulky right hilar lymphadenopathy. Number three, buried findings. Uh, some findings in incidental lomas, um, say things like cysts or benign pairing adrenal lesions, for example, can sometimes get buried within a sea of sentences somewhere um, in the finding section and not appear in the impression section. 
And this tends to be um, uh, when a radiologist sees a finding or incident in loma, that's probably clinically insignificant. However, sometimes a relevant piece of information or context was not shared with the radiologist, and what seemed insignificant might actually require workup. This may require readers of radiology reports to embark on a treasure hunt for buried findings and incidental lomas in every report they come across, which can consume valuable time and energy. Number four, abstruse prose in the finding sections of radiology reports not only can get in the way of a reader, but sometimes the radiologist writing the report too. Take, for example, when the impression section of a report is being composed. Opportunities for accidentally excluding or confusing a finding during the synthesis interpretation that occurs when crafting the impression is more likely to happen in this situation and can result in discrepancies between the findings and impression sections of report that can confuse others. Number five, Incomplete diagnosis in the impression of a radiology report can impede a reader's ability to fully understand the ramifications of a patient's imaging study. This may happen in reports where the impression is just a restatement of facts established in the findings section bereft of interpretation or diagnosis. As the saying goes, um, it's tough to be wrong when you're just simply restating facts. This can happen um, in situations where um, a radiologist sees a finding and that finding is entirely nonspecific. Um, it can happen if the imaging study itself was inadequate and isn't able to narrow down the differential diagnosis. Sometimes this can happen because an imaging finding was particularly peculiar or unfamiliar and its clinical significance is honestly unknown. Ambiguity with regards to the degree of diagnostic confidence is another form of insufficient diagnosis. A radiologist's excessive penchant for hedging might lead a reader to underestimate the degree of diagnostic confidence, like in this passage where a speculated invasive lung mass that was almost certainly cancer was described as, quote, concerning for cancer, unquote. Or when a radiologist's reluctance to use the word normal results in the injection of unnecessary ambivalence. Phrases such as unremarkable, no evidence of, or grossly normal are other hallmarks of this situation. And here are some more examples. Sometimes the clinical significance of a diagnosis may be poorly conveyed in impressions. It may be something as simple as the order in which different impression items appear. In this example, an apparent esophageal cancer was buried way down the list as item number five, below chronic bronchitis, some tiny benign lung nodules, and other more trivial issues. This can happen at the bullet level, too, if a radiologist doesn't lead with key diagnostic words, but rather leaves them at the end of a very long sentence, like in this example. Providing management recommendations are an important way Radiologists take responsibility for an imaging study and patient care. Sometimes, however, an abnormal finding may be present, but recommended next steps and follow-up measures are insufficient. An, expect an expected recommendation may be entirely absent sometimes, such as in this example where a solid 9mm lung nozzle was discovered. Sometimes recommendations are entirely absent when the best course of action is very unclear to the radiologist. A recommendation may be absent because significant additional information and context required to decide the best course of action are unavailable to the radiologist or very challenging to access. Sometimes recommendations may be present, but linked to lots of individual impression items and effectively scattered throughout the impression which increases the odds that one recommendation might get accidentally missed by the reader. On rare occasions, a recommendation might even appear only in the findings section, making the odds of being missed even more likely. 
That's why there is an emerging trend among some radiologists to collate and break out recommendations together at the end of a radiology report like in this example. The strength of a recommendation in a radiology report may sometimes be vague, leaving referring providers confused as to just how badly a recommended action needs to occur or not. An example is in this passage where MR imaging um, is described as um, perhaps able to provide better characterization in the appropriate clinical setting. Other words like suggested or consider um, may be used for similar ends. While not clearly communicating the strength of a recommendation could sometimes be due to a knowledge or experience gap, it can also happen in settings where a radiologist is aware that strong recommendations tend to create medical legal implications that may obligate a referring provider to take a certain course of action, but the radiologist himself is uncomfortable making that strong recommendation because some crucial piece of clinical context might be missing. In cases where the appropriate next step is unequivocal, hopefully, the recommendation strength is clearly conveyed, such as in this example. The recommendations in a radiology report may frankly just be unclear in some reports. Something we occasionally encounter with incidental lomas is this practice where a lengthy boilerplate passage covering any and all scenarios is pasted into a report, rather than just a short, concise, explicit recommendation. This tends to strike me as a little passive-aggressive, shifting the burden of interpreting these guidelines, such as the Fleischmann Society guidelines, for example, entirely onto the referring provider, instead of spending just a few extra seconds to dictate a short, discrete recommendation. Recommendations may sometimes be unclear because not enough detail is provided. With a statement like, imaging follow-up recommended, what imaging study should be done? Should it be a CT, an MRI, ultrasound, or a PET scan? And if, let's say it's a CT, would you do it with or without contrast? And when should it be done? Recommendations uh, statements like the version in the bottom here provide much more clarity to the referring provider. Recommendations are also particularly unclear when all effort to provide specific steps and follow-up measures are jettisoned, and the recommendation becomes a blanket statement like clinical correlation recommended, rather than something um, better, like in the um, version in the bottom here. Number seven, another impediment to deciphering radiology reports, particularly the impression, is when picking out the prime takeaway points begins to feel like you're looking for a needle in a haystack, such as when impressions are overloaded with umpteen points ranging from the important to the trivial, like in this example, or when the language used becomes extremely wordy and tortuous. Take, for example, the passage on top here, which could have been much more efficiently and clearly communicated as lung metastases have enlarged. Number eight, lastly, jargon. Distinctive words or terms used by radiologists or other subspecialists that are difficult for everyone else to understand. Jargon can impede um, referring providers' ability to decipher impressions sometimes. Let's look at some examples where jargon gets in the way. Would folks be better served if all the radiology MRI jargon in the top passage here were confined to the finding section and the impression simply read, cardiac sarcoidosis? Would folks be better served if subspecialist interstitial lung disease jargon, such as the phrase on top here, were replaced by something like smoking-related ILD in this ED chest CT report impression? Would folks be better served if an abstruse acronym like HLT were replaced by heart and lung transplant? On the flip side, jargon can sometimes get unintentionally invoked and accidentally create issues too. For example, the word progression has a very specific meaning to oncologists, namely at least a 20% growth in the size of a tumor. But what if a radiologist meant to say the lung mets had slightly grown, not 20%, and was just using the term progressive in a everyday sort of way? Here's another example. Let's say a radiologist saw heavy coronary artery calcification in the right coronary artery, circumflex, and LAD on a non-conscious chest CT and wrote in their impression, severe three-vessel coronary artery disease. Unbeknownst to them, this phrase 
could potentially get interpreted by a cardiologist as stating that there is over 70% stenosis of the RCA, circumflex, and LAD, which may not necessarily be what the radiologist meant to communicate. And now the patient's off to get cath. Hopefully you found it valuable to review some of these commonly encountered obstacles in radiology reports with me that can impede people's ability to decipher them. There are often rational reasons behind why reports get written the way that they do, but sometimes um, these practices can make reports tough for folks to decipher. Although it may not be always practical or feasible to entirely eliminate every one of these impediments from our radiology reports, being conscious of them while we write the reports can meaningfully move the needle towards better care and outcomes.